Rub up your engines! Today I'm going to talk about electronic emergency brake systems. Because if you don't know it, modern cars don't have a pull up emergency brake or a step on emergency brake. They have an electronic one. And to turn it on you flip the switch, that turns it on. Then when you turn it off, what you do is you put it in drive. This is an electronic transmission. Then you push this forward. The light goes off and it's now turned off. Oh, please bring back the simpler days like my Celica. Here's the emergency brake. Real simple. On, off. And there's a cable that goes to the bank. Now why oh why have they replaced a simple cable system that can last forever with electronic gizmo? Well, you know why? Because they can. And they can charge you a ton of money to fix it when the stupid things break. Because instead of having a simple cable assembly that pulls them, they now use electric switch, goes through a, a computer module. In this case, the computer module costs $697, and they do go bad, because of course, Fiat, Italian, Chrysler design, which are notorious for having electrical problems anyway. Then they eventually go to two electric motors on the rear wheels that clamp them down. I'll pull this wheel off and show you. And we come down here, we can see there's the electric cable, and there's a little motor that squeezes the brakes for the emergency. And then it's supposed to release them. And as you can see, it's plastic. There's one on this side and one on the other side. And they're about 115 bucks a piece when they go bad. And yes, they do go bad being plastic, electronic stuff that are soaked in water while you drive down the road all the time. Plus it makes it a bigger pain in the butt when you change the brake pads because they're spiral. You gotta have a special tool to squeeze them and turn them at the same time. I'll show you right now. First you unbolt the caliper. Out comes the bolt. As you can see, the tool fits in here. Right in here. So now, when you turn this, it also turns the caliper so it goes in. You can't squeeze it or you'll break the stupid thing. You have to have this tool that both turns and pushes in at the same time. And once you're done turning, you can see it's pushed the piston in so now it can slide over the brake pads. Then you just turn this by hand to get it loose. And it comes out of the hall. Take the rest of the tool off. You can see it's stuck in there now. Now you can see it's got the three little holes where the three lines come. Here's the tool. See, it's got the three little pieces that fit in. Without that, you'll destroy the motor and everything and it'll cost you a fortune. So, you gotta have the tool. And now that we put new pads in, then with the new brake pads on, you slide the caliper on, get the bolt, and bolt it back in place. Now get it super tight. And you'll notice, I have lock in place here. That's because these are so cheaply made. The little nut, you can see the one on the top here, it spins free if you try to put it tight. So you got to tighten it with this. Then when you pull on this, it stays in place and locks. Please, that's when you're done. Off it goes. Here we go. The emergency brake is off. Spins. Now let's put it on. I hear it make a noise. And as you can see now, I can't turn it. It's locked on. Now we'll release it to make sure it releases. And now it's released. Now as you can see, these electronic parking brakes, they made a very simple cable system turn into a complex monstrosity. $670 for the module, $112 a piece for the motors, then there's wiring in between on the switch. There's a lot of expensive crap that can go wrong. To me, this is just engineers playing around so they can control things with electronics instead of physical. It's going to cost you more in the long run. There's no arguing that. Now, being a sealed electronic system, there's no maintenance involved. I mean, you want to hope they have the sealed for water good because it's going to go through water in the back of the car driving through mud and snow and whatever. It's going to get all over here. So you better hope that they sealed these things really well when they built them. Now, other than staying away from deep water or salt water in the ocean that can Wrote all the stuff. There's no maintenance on these things because they're 100% electronic. But being electronic, hey, everybody knows electronic stuff breaks eventually. And especially something like that. It's got to be a pretty strong electric motor in order to hold the thing in place. So, you know, at some point in time, these things are going to burn out. And burn out, they do. So now you know how electronic emergency brake systems work and why they might not be such a hot deal. Because after all, if you got an emergency brake that you step on, or that you pull. If you got an emergency situation to stop, you can control it somewhat. With this thing, it's electronic. Your ability to control the range of how it breaks 
isn't all that great. Now, for parking, yeah, you're sitting, you're parking, it's there. But for an actual emergency, you can get me the old hand ones or the foot ones like in my wife's Lexus and a lot of American cars have the foot ones. You get a lot better control in emergency situations than some stupid little button that you pull and hope that it does its job. So if you ask me in this case, technology is taking a giant leap backwards. Give me the old cable or the old step on emergency brake where you have a better control in emergency situation than flipping some stupid little switch and praying that the motor does its thing fast enough and at an even enough degree that it stops straight. And here's some bonus questions and answers. My nail says, I told my wife I'd get her a newer used car for graduation. She wants a truck, a Tundra, but we don't haul anything. I want a four cylinder full size truck, but can't find one. The only four cylinder full size truck I know of is they came out with that Silverado, I believe, last year that has a four cylinder engine. I would not buy it. I would not have anybody buy that. I don't trust the GM quality. It's turbocharged. It's probably not going to last that long. The best four cylinder pickup truck out there is the Toyota Tacoma. It's not a full-size truck. It's big enough. You say you don't haul anything. You might take her out one. See what it's like, you know? See if she likes it or not. You can get a Ford Ranger with a four-cylinder engine and a two, and you can get a Nissan Frontier. That's an okay one with a four-cylinder. You could get a used Frontier Ranger a lot cheaper than a used Tacoma, because Tacomas keep their value. But the only real full-size one is this new Silverado. I would not advise you to buy that. They're not cheap, and I wouldn't trust them. Not putting a four-cylinder in a big truck like that, and it's a new design, too. Ninja Slayer says, when I'm I'm trying to find used two-wheel drive Honda CRVs. I keep finding four-wheel CRVs. Why? Uh I'm assuming a lot of it has to do with where you are. Here in Houston, I rarely see a four-wheel drive CRV. Nobody wastes their money. But you're living up in Buffalo or Duluth or someplace or northern Canada, people buy the four-wheel drive once for the snow. So it probably has more to do with the area that you're in because Honda sells a lot more two-wheel drives than they do four-wheel drives. That just must be the area that you're going. I mean, if you're looking for a really good one, maybe you should come down to Texas, buy it, and drive it back. I know guys in Chicago that do that four or five times a year. They come down here. They buy cars with a car carrier, bring them back, and sell them for a big profit in Chicago. Zaid says, Scotty, I got a Nissan Pathfinder all-wheel drive, 2016, 33,000 miles. This year, it's a gas hog. I barely reached 20 miles a gallon. My commute is almost highway, and I'm an easy driver. I don't gun it. We only got 33,000 miles. Now, this is something that I always warn people about. This is why you don't buy all-wheel drive if you want gas mileage. They all get worse gas mileage entirely. Now, you can try my video, How to Clean Fuel Injectors Without Removal and Play a Mechanic, like me, with a pressurized machine to pressure clean the fuel injectors and make sure your air filter and fuel filter are nice and clean and aren't clogged up. But past that, those things are gas hogs. I got a customer with one of those. You're whining about 20 miles a gallon. He gets 15 miles a gallon on his. That's just the nature of all-wheel drive vehicles. You got all wheels driving all the time, more friction, worse gas mileage, plus more weight for the system itself which leads to worse gas mileage. So, I mean, do have the fuel injectors clean, but if that's the case, yeah, it's just that thing is going to get. All vehicles are sort of individualistic. I remember when I was young, I knew two brothers in Illinois. They bought the same exact vehicle, and one got better gas mileage than the other, and one was faster than the other when they would race going down the highway to see how fast they could go. So, even though they were both made in the same factory, the same company, they weren't the same exact cars. There's always a little bit difference here and there. McBoy says, friend, has an OHRE Equinox, 190,000 miles. Car isn't idling and shaking. I get a code for cylinder five misfire, and I've replaced all the spark plugs and wires, but it didn't help. What can I do next? All right, could be a coil. I'll make it misfire. But realize, misfire is sometimes a misnomer. Kind of fools you. It says misfire. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the ignition system. You got a bad fuel injector, sprays too much gas or not enough gas, you'll get a misfire in that cylinder. 190,000 miles, there is a GM product. You could have the head gasket starting to blow around number five cylinder. That would also cause a misfire. Lots of things can cause misfires. You need to check all those things, but do check the coil first, because that's the easiest, cheapest thing to replace. Could just be the coil. No courses, thanks for the videos. I got a 2013 smart car and a traction control light comes on. I know it's due to the pre Previous owner messing with the steering angle sensor. Clock spring mechanism. Can they be reset or do they have to be replaced? You find somebody with that Mercedes computer, first reset it and see what happens. If you mess with it, it has to be reset. Now, if you reset it and it still doesn't work, then you're going to have to replace it. Guys, who knows what the guy did? But do try to reset it first. That's the thing about modern cars. Everything's run by computer and they all correlate. And if anything's worked on and disturbed, 
it has to be reset. Otherwise, it's going to be wrong and the traction control will be way up because it doesn't know what the right angle of the steering is. When you're going straight, it's not showing straight and it confuses it. It'll turn a light on telling you that the system's disabled because it's getting weird information. So try the resetting, but don't be surprised if it needs a new clock spring mechanism too. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.